I was a bit nervous the Sunday sermon music was going to go on strike there. But yes, that is the music that talk says that it is time for my Sunday sermon. And no surprise, I want to talk about the lockdown lessons that we've learnt so far, the revelations that have come out. And I absolutely believe they have been overwhelmingly in the public interest. And today's revelations, without question, seal that lock, stock and bow. Do you remember, way back at the very beginning, just under three years ago, it's hard to believe, is it? Do you remember those words? Following the science. We're led by the science. We're making the right decisions at the right time based on the best scientific advice. Do you remember those other words? We've thrown a protective ring around the care homes. What a load of utter garbage. And this week has proven that. Do you remember those other words? Save lives and protect the NHS. Well, what we're seeing with these lockdown files and the stories that are coming out and the excess deaths that continue even now with no explanation, no examination. The truth is the NHS is knackered. The truth is that the lockdowns probably cost more lives than were saved. Just look at those excess deaths. And you remember in those early days, never once, as the government was trying to terrify everybody, never once did they set out the context of, look, every death is sad, but if someone dies above the average life expectancy, it's sad, but is it a tragedy? They never put that into context. They always wanted to terrify people. And what we've seen this week is that the health secretary, his advisers, and the, indeed the cabinet secretary, who's supposed to be impartial, they actually got a thrill by, in an authoritarian way, telling people what to do. They literally got off on locking people in hotels as they came off aeroplanes. They got off with excitement on telling the police to act like the secret police in North Korea, for heaven's sake, when at the same time they knew that there were parties going on in Number 10. And this is the evidence. They got off on the idea, and indeed wasted time, on the excitable idea they might be able to lock up Nigel Farage. Why weren't they focusing on the job of actually making the right decisions? And we now know that actually there was no examination of the cost-benefit analysis of locking up children, of not schooling children, some of whom, as you've heard earlier on David's show, and as Isabel has written on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph, some of whom tragically absolutely tragically ended up so distraught that they committed suicide. It's a heart, heart-wrenching story. I was in floods of tears when I first read it. And the only reason I can't read it again today is that I shall probably break down in tears. A hundred thousand children disappeared from schools afterwards. And yet what the government, people at the top of government were doing, they were bullying anybody who questioned any of their decisions. Prime Minister Sunak, he was the Chancellor at the time, he challenged Matt Hancock. And Hancock's response was, do you want to stop the virus or do you want to show an ankle to the hard right? It's not hard right, Mr Hancock, to question, to test, to challenge, to make sure that good decisions, the right decisions, if possible, are being made. Ridiculous comment. He swore about anybody who wanted to question, well, what's going on in Sweden? Are their tactics right, wrong, possibly of interest? Even though actually it's turned out there were massive lessons to learn because they've ended up with better results overall. He was more focused on propelling his career into the next league than actually on making the right decisions. As I say, anybody who questioned was smeared, was labelled, was ostracised. They were sort of called the awkward squad. Hard right. And it turns out that the spin doctors around Boris were manipulating him, calling the Prime Minister of the day a shopping trolley. 
and that they were manipulating him in order to make, to get the decisions that they wanted, as opposed to giving the Prime Minister the right data, the right information to try and make the best decisions possible. And in terms of scientific advice, there can be nothing more damning than the fact that we've seen this week the proof that the decision on children wearing masks in schools had nothing to do with the efficiency of masks. It was all about the fact that the government was scared of Sergeant Major Sturgeon in Scotland. For 16 months, our children, millions of children, wore these dirty, filthy, smelly pieces of cloth that were utterly, utterly useless, just in order because they were cowardly and scared of Nicola Sturgeon. For heaven's sake, what on earth went on? The damage, the massive damage to children's mental health, to their education, to their well-being. And for some, as has been seen in the article on the front page of The Telegraph. For some, it was too much. They couldn't cope. And then we heard about the rule of six. Do you remember that? And in England, that included children under the age of 12, even though they knew that it made no difference whatsoever. No difference whatsoever. In fact, bizarrely, Sturgeon had a different rule there. So the irony of it, why weren't they prepared to have a different rule for the masks? utterly extraordinary. The truth was they didn't want to be seen to have possibly been wrong before. Surely that's what we want in our leaders, a recognition that, yeah, it was incredibly difficult. They, and we hope they were doing their best. What they should have said is, look, this is unprecedented. We're doing our best. We'll get some things right. We'll get some things wrong. When we get it wrong, we'll adapt, we'll alter course, and we'll tell you, please bear with us. That would have been the right thing to do, but that's not what happened. And then we learned today, unbelievably, that they were deliberately looking to deploy the news of the new variant at the absolute peak moment, so that, to use Mr Hancock's words, they could, in inverted commas, frighten the pants off everybody. I just repeat, they actually wanted to frighten the pants of everybody. The cabinet secretary, a few weeks later, saying he wants to ramp up the fear, the guilt factor amongst the population. He wanted us to feel guilty for living our lives. What sort of man is he? Oh, he's the cabinet secretary, currently, still. I don't know how he can still hold his position, given what he said. And there was a complete lack of courage Rishi Sunak knew it was wrong at the time. As it turns out, did Gavin Williamson, who's at least had the courage this week to come out and say that he seriously thought about resigning, if he had resigned in January 2021, things would have been very different for our children. It would have changed the course of policy. If it stood up to Hancock, just imagine how that might have changed things. But he didn't. He caved in to Mr Hancock and co. And then the Prime Minister's sister, Rachel Johnson, who knew that she was a lockdown sceptic, and you can sort of understand as the Prime Minister's sister that she kept quiet, she wasn't a member of the government at the time, but she was a massive lockdown sceptic, and she wrote in the Telegraph about her concerns. Her own mother, she described in a care home prison, the inhumanity of it all. And it went on for month after month after month into years in the care homes. And for those of us who did have the courage to stand up and question this stuff and campaign against lockdowns and to challenge the data, whether you're a scientific expert like Carl Hennigan or someone like me or many others, David Bull, Rennie Hundekap and many, many others, we were vilified. Other journalists said that we were killers. Well, we know now who, we actually know now who really had more impact on destroying lives, it wasn't us. No, it was those in the positions of power. So there's no question at all with the revelations today that the decision 
to release these files was absolutely in the public interest. We can see the difference between what was really the actual advice from one line of scientists and what was government spin and, frankly, BS. We can see the reality of what was going on behind the scenes, the pettiness, the sort of self-promotion. And let's be clear, there were plenty of journalists who were in Number 10's press room who didn't do their job. They utterly failed. They had the chance to challenge the government, to hold them to account. All they did was argue for ever deeper restrictions. Where were they challenging, saying, well, where's the evidence? Is the data right? Are you sure? They never asked those questions. And all they do now is attack the messenger because they're so embarrassed by the utter, woeful, incompetent failings. But enough of the past. That's part of my rant. What of the future? Well, what can we do about it? Let's focus on the public inquiry, which we now know is going to take years and years and years. And we've raised this. And yet the Baroness Hallett, the chair of the inquiry, she's denied it. But let's just remind ourselves, the Savile inquiry into Bloody Sunday took 10 years and cost 200 million quid. The Chilcot inquiry took seven years. This is way, way bigger. And if you read the three pages of the terms of reference, you'll see that. It'll go on for years. They've already spent and committed 116 million quid on contracts to lawyers and to IT firms for five-year contracts. So I think that tells you how long they think this is going to go on for. At least five years. It's at a glacial pace. It was back in May 21, the Prime Minister then, Boris Johnson, said, we're setting up a public inquiry. It took them nine months to find someone to run it. December 21. Here we are, two years on from May 21. They haven't even started hearing the evidence. They're going to start, so we'll be pleased to know, in June for six weeks. Oh, and then it's summer, isn't it? So they're going to take a two-month summer break. And it's all being split into modules, but they've only agreed the timing for the first module. Timing's to be confirmed for all the numerous other modules. Why can't they run the modules in parallel? I'll be talking about that later with John Dobinson in the second hour of the show. Here's my estimate, folks. I think this inquiry could well cost three hundred million pounds. I think it'll take at least five years, probably nearer ten. And all those in positions of power, of responsibility, of leadership, they'll all have moved on. They won't really care. Everybody will have moved on. And that's why I was delighted that Keir Starmer himself in the House of Commons on Wednesday asked that the inquiry should be finished by December. Former party chairman of the Conservative Party, Baroness Varsi, Likewise, this inquiry needs to produce its first interim reports to all of the key issues this year, 2023. Is that possible? Well, let's head back to Sweden, shall we? They finished their inquiry 12 months ago. It's got a simple 30-page summary in English. I'd highly recommend it. They produced a phased report, finished in February 2022. I was very interested in the letter in today's Sunday Telegraph by uh, someone who suggested maybe we should have a citizen's inquiry chaired by someone like Lord Sumption. Or perhaps we should start our own. We could get to the heart of it. Because at this rate, this inquiry, I fear, will be utterly, utterly hopeless. It'll take too long and too much will be covered up to spare the blushes of those involved. Whatever happens, this inquiry should be dedicated to those who sadly, who tragically, left us during the COVID lockdowns. Here endeth my Sunday sermon.